From the shores of Zanzibar to the banks of the Nile, the Arab slave trade spread its wicked web, entrapping lives with malevolent glee. The trafficking of African slaves began 1,400 years ago, with millions shipped across the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean. So today, we'll unearth the less explored Arab slave trade under the Omanis. So how did East Africa and North Africa get entangled in this illicit trade? How did the Zanzibar Revolution and the Bantu revolts in Iraq come into play? And how did this illicit trade thrive in Arabia with Mecca, the holiest city of Islam, being the epicenter? To understand the Arab slave trade, we must first grasp its historical context. Also known as the Indian Ocean slave trade, spanned over a millennium, starting around the 7th century. To put it into context, between 17 million and 28 million Africans have been enslaved in the Muslim world over the past 14 centuries. These staggering numbers paint the astonishing reality and extent of slavery. In comparison, about 12 million Africans were shipped across the Atlantic right about the same time. While much has been written on the transatlantic slave trade, surprisingly little attention has been given to this one across the Indian Ocean. Many races were enslaved, not just people of African descent. According to Ibn Bullah's writings on the Guide to Racism, the Indians and the Nubians were taken in force to be guards. The Zanjo servants and eunuchs, while the Turks and Slavs became soldiers. The Zanjo refers to the Bantu people living in current-day Kenya and Tanzania, which include Mijikenda, Taita, Kikuyu, Kamba, Swahili, and many more. Some of the ethnic groups taken from Tanzania and Mozambique, as well as Malawi, include the Majindo, Makua, Nyasa, Yao, Zalama, Zaramo, and Zigua. See, by the 8th century AD, the Babas had conquered North Africa. Then Islam started to spread southwards along the Nile and the desert trails through the Sahara. Along the Indian Ocean coast, Zanzibar, Cairo, Baghdad were all bustling hubs for commercial human trafficking. Although most countries have since outlawed slavery, arguably a form of modern slave trade still happens today. In the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and Yemen officially abolished slavery in 1962 while Oman followed in 1970. Mauritania became the last state to abolish slavery in 1980. In contrast to the Arab slave trade, European involvement in the transatlantic shipping to the Americas lasted for over three centuries. I'm sure you're all in agreement that both in the transatlantic and the Arab slave trades, they were both equally brutal and destructive, but it's only fair to acknowledge both in equal measure. If you are finding value in this video, please leave a thumbs up. It really makes a difference. So what about the slavery in East Africa? It all began after the Muslim Arabs and Swahili traders won control over the Swahili coast, which stretches all the way from Mombasa to the Swaziland coast. Major towns and ports engaged in the trade include Bagamoyo, Kelua, Mombasa, Mogadishu, Zanzibar, Kismayu, and even Nyangwe in the Congo. Economic motivations lay at the heart of the Arab slave trade. Voracious demand for labor in agriculture, domestic service, and even military service drove the relentless pursuit of human beings as commodities. See, the East African slave trade flourished greatly from the second half of the 19th century, especially when Said bin Sultan and Oman Sultan made Zanzibar's capital. Zanzibar is a top tourist destination renowned for its tropical beaches, crystal blue oceans, and deep culture. However, the Zanzibar we so much love today was once Africa's fish market of the slave trade. The Arab slave traders captured Africa's ethnic Bantu peoples from the interior of modern-day Kenya, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, and Tanzania, and then brought them to the coast, making them making Zanzibar the center of the Arab slave trade. It is said that only one of four slaves made it to Stone Town, as the rest died of hunger, disease, and weeping. When traveling in the Africa's Great Lakes, the explorer and missionary Dr. Livingstone documents in his book, and I quote, 
27th June 1866. Today, we came upon a man dead from starvation as he was very thin. One of our men wandered and found many slaves with slave sticks on, abandoned by their masters from want of food. They were too weak to be able to speak or say where they'd come from. Some were quite young. End of quote. Such and more were the stories of the inhumane treatment of the slaves who walked thousands of miles from the interior of Africa to the East African coast. Livingstone concludes by writing, The strangest disease I've seen in this country seems really to be broken heartedness and it attacks free men who have been captured and made slaves. You'd think that slavery would have ended by the 21st century, but the Zanzibar Revolution of 1964 proves otherwise. The Zanzibarians under the leadership of General Okello overthrew their sultan slave lords in the revolution facilitating the merging of Tanganyika and Zanzibar forming Tanzania. There were also revolts on the Kenyan coast, including Mombasa, but they were quickly squashed and the slaves eliminated. While almost all the slaves shipped across the Atlantic were for agricultural work, most of the slaves destined for the Muslim Middle East were for sexual exploitation as concubines and in harems. The men were taken for military service and as laborers. Besides, while two of every three slaves shipped across the Atlantic were men, the proportions were reversed in the Indian slave trade. Two women for every man were enslaved by the Muslims. Most of the slaves destined for the Middle East were castrated, and most of the children born to the women were killed at birth. A couple of trade routes were used by the merchants. In the Horn of Africa in North Africa, the traffic often started from Nubia, which is present-day Sudan, where they were transported through Chad and Egypt. Muslim Arabs then transported slaves to the Arabia, the Mediterranean, Damascus, and even as far north as Yugoslavia and as far east as India. In fact, the present-day Indian Sindhi people would, are known as descendants of the Bantu people of East Africa and were taken in the 7th century as well. Another route was through the Maghreb. Some slaves were transported from Western Sudan, Chad, and Bono, which is present-day Nigeria, and then, then taken to the Maghreb. Others were taken from Timbuktu in Algeria. Once they reached in the port of Tripoli, the slaves were shipped across the Mediterranean to Greece, Sicily, Turkey, and southern Yugoslavia. So how were the slaves captured in a seemingly intimidating interior of Africa? One notorious trader was Tipoti, an Afro-Mani plantation owner. This guy led major trade expeditions, numbering 4,000 men into the interior of Central Africa. The slaves ferried ivory to the coast and ended up being sold in the markets of Zanzibar for large profits. In his spices and gloves and plantations alone, Tipu Tip had 10,000 men in bondage. The capture and transportation of these people was a nightmarish ordeal. Tipu and his men employed various methods, mostly raids, warfare, and deceit to seize men, women, and children from their homelands. Their journey was one of unspeakable horrors overcrowded ships, unsanitary conditions, and unimaginable suffering. Once in the Arab world, slaves endured unimaginable brutality. Physical and psychological abuse was inflicted upon them on a daily basis. Beatings, branding, and sexual exploitation were grim realities that they faced. The sad truth, however, is Africans were also involved in capturing and selling fellow men to slavery. See, African states and chiefdoms played a key role in the enslavement of these people, and slavery was actually a common practice among sub-Saharan Africans even before the involvement of the Arabs, Babas, and Europeans. Of course, the Arabs commercialized it, and the Europeans further globalized the atrocity. You might ask, why didn't the Africans fight back? Well, they actually did. A case in point is the Zanj Rebellion, a series of revolts that took place between 869 AD and 883 AD near the city of Basra, which is situated in present-day Iraq. Under the leadership of Ali ibn Muhammad, the Bantu slaves revolted in the thousands against the Abbasid Caliphal Empire. 
You see, the temperatures in Basra go as high as 48 degrees centigrade. Yet, the Zanj slaves were needed to work under the hot, humid marshlands of southern Iraq. The Tigris, Euphrates, and Daita, which had become abandoned marshland as a result of peasant migration and repeated flooding, could be reclaimed through intensive labor. At least, that's according to the slave owners. The Zanj Rebellion became the most famous African slave revolt in the Middle East. These are the peoples from the Great Lakes region that I've mentioned earlier. Cultural evidence is there today in the Persian Gulf as descendants of people from the Swahili coast perform the traditional liwa and fun tabura music and dance from the East African regions. The Mizma is also performed by the Afro-Arabs in Eastern Saudi Arabia, which is akin to the practice in present-day East Africa. Reflecting on this legacy, we are reminded of the enduring consequences of the Arab slave trade. It shaped continental relations and distorted perceptions of race. The African continent was bled of its most valuable human resources via all possible routes, across the Sahara, through the Red Sea, from the Indian Ocean ports and across the Atlantic. Inevitably, African countries were destabilized and left vulnerable to conquest, colonization, and violence for centuries. Acknowledging this history and learning from it is vital to fostering understanding and preventing similar atrocities in the future. If you find this content useful, please like and subscribe. Now, catch me next time as we cross the oceans to the beautiful island nation of Haiti, the first black nation to form a republic after successfully revolting against the unholy trinity of colonization slavery and white supremacy. Until then, Kwaheri.